All right, thank you so much and welcome everyone to our session on best practices for student faculty collaboration, where we'll be exploring our approaches to empowering students as co-creators of knowledge and storytelling. My name is Dr. Michelle Hassendonks, and I serve as the AVP for Student Academic Success and Equity Initiatives. Um, and I have the pleasure of working with and advocating for and supporting initiatives that bring together students and faculty to collaborate on projects that benefit both, um, as well as benefit our campus and local community. And I cannot say those words, nor look at my virtual background um, and our city without first acknowledging that our campus community was recently and is still currently impacted by the mountain fire, um, blazing over 20,000 acres right in the hillsides um, that you see up above and beyond. Um, many of us or our loved ones are um, in evacuation areas or experiencing power outages, um, and our campus as well as our local schools have been closed for the last two days. Um, but despite that, I want to share my appreciation for those joining us on the panel here today for all that you do to support our students, our community, one another, especially in these difficult times. Um, some of us are joining you from our homes um, with tiny coworkers or from campus where there is electricity. And so we um, just appreciate your, your grace and, and patience in, in that. But for this moment, we are very so proud to be here with you today to represent this great work um, and work that honors our community and storytelling. Today's panel brings together a group of faculty mentors, a project director and students from CSU Channel Islands, each of whom who has been instrumental in guiding two podcasts that illuminate the power of student faculty partnerships in community storytelling. Our panelists include Elena Haloma, Project Director of SOAR at CI, a Department of Education Developing Hispanic Serving Institutions grant. Dr. Christina Smith, Faculty Mentor um, in the Communication Department and Advisor to the Dolphin Radio Station. Dr. Nancy Chen, Communications Professor, a Faculty Mentor. And Librarians, Dr. Monica Pereira and University Archivist Evelyn Taylor from the John Spohr Broom Library. Joining them is Kayla Gerardo, communication student and CSU um, at CSU Channel Islands, um, who has taken um, a part in one of these collaborative projects as a podcaster and storyteller. Um, I do also want to mention Sofia Banuelos, another communication student whose work we will share about, but who could not be with us here this morning. And so the first project titled First Generation Professionals um, is a podcast series where students interviewed first generation graduates about navigating their early careers. And through this storytelling initiative, students gained valuable insights into the hidden curriculum of career preparation, um, especially relevant for historically underrepresented communities. So this series aimed to demystify that transition from college to career, creating resources that resonate um, with students, families, and supporters um, who may not be familiar with these career pathways. And so we'll hear from the faculty mentor and student podcaster on the strategies that helped make this project impactful. The second podcast, developed in partnership with the John Spore Broom Library, combines archival research with contemporary interviews to celebrate the legacy of author Michelle Seros and the history of the Camarillo State Hospital, um, now home to CSU Channel Islands. And so with guidance from faculty mentors, students delved into the archives, located key interviewees, and crafted episodes that bridge past and present narratives. So faculty will share their insights on fostering student-led research and reflect on unique challenges and successes of bringing these archival stories to life. Um, together, these projects demonstrate the richness of student-faculty collaboration, not only in enhancing academic skills, um, but in fostering a deep connection to community, history, and future aspirations. We look forward to an engaging discussion on how to create successful partnerships that benefit both students and faculty alike. And so with that, I'm going to hand over um, to my colleague, Elena Haloma. Uh, yes, well, good morning here, but I see that some people are from Maine and other places, so hello. Um, Elena Haloma, so thankful to be here with you all today. Um, I'm excited to share with you 
Um, a little bit of an overview. I do just want to start by apologizing and saying that I am one of those people that has a very tiny coworker and does not take direction well. <laughs> so I'm sorry up front. <laughs> uh, so uh, but but yeah, so I'm here to talk to a little bit about the what kind of got this all started. So um <laughs> sorry, there he goes. Um what got this started was that we uh, applied for a grant through um, Cal State University Channel, uh, excuse me, Northridge, um, who has funding through something called um, an HSI Community Foundation and a community grant. And so we were able to, to apply for this grant and um, we called our grant Channel Your Potential. And the focus around Channel Your Potential is really thinking about first generation college students. Uh, a, majority of our, a great, I will say a, a, a large number of the students at Cal State Channel Islands identify as first in their family to go to college. And so we're always thinking of ways to um, best support those students, knowing that they are a large number of our population and thinking about the unique um, pieces that come with being a student from that background. And uh, one of the things that we're thinking about as we as this grant was developed was about um, beyond their experience at the university and thinking about this concept of a first generation professional. And so, um, which is where the, the radio um, podcast came from. But uh, before that gets told, I kind of wanted to share a little bit more about the background and, and what this grant um, was was intended to do aside from um, the podcast. So we applied for the grant. We were um, awarded, let's see, $139,000 in order to support these efforts. And our focus, again, was to prepare students for post-graduation careers in STEM, um, creative, and tech industries. Those were the areas that we were looking at. We were looking particularly, again, to focus on students who identify from our Latinx or um, historically underrepresented groups, including first-generation professionals. And uh, some of the grant objectives include Included, um, building students' self-academic efficacy and motivation with their academic disciplines, increase to increase students' sense of connection to the university and sense of belonging to the college, to deepen students' a sense of preparedness for the workforce as first generation professionals and to increase students knowledge skills and experiences necessary for engaged citizenship and career success. Uh, so really, I hope what you see and what you hear in that is that we were really thinking about what do students need in order to be prepared beyond college because you know we develop we have all these programs we have an understanding of what first generation college students need while they're in college, but thinking about that once, if you're a first generation college student, you're always a first generation college student. And so really helping to prepare them for that life beyond and teaching them about concepts. Um, a lot of times in, in um, with first gen students, we might talk about things like hidden curriculum, which I know Kayla will probably get into as she talks about uh, what we put into the podcast. And, and so really thinking about these concepts and, and, and teasing them out for students so that they are better prepared or they they leave our university better prepared for the futures ahead. Uh, with those objectives, some activities that we um, built into that work were um, first-gen peer coaching, which is what um, Kayla uh, served as in, in her role. Um, we also um, developed, of course, the podcast series, which you're all here to learn about today. And then um, the other piece to the grant was culturally responsive events. And so some things that we identified that would um, follow up in that area included a first generation networking social. So we brought together, we worked with our career development office and uh, brought together um, alumni who identified as first generation professionals and brought them with our first gen students on campus and were able to do a networking event for them. Um, we also celebrated very proudly on our campus uh, first gen week, which actually um, is actually today. Um, National First Generation College Student Day is today. And, uh, and then the other thing that we um, celebrated within this work was uh, National Hispanic Serving Institution Week, HSI Week, and being that this grant was because of our HSI status. And so uh, anyhow, there's a lot of great work involved with this grant, but one of the most exciting pieces of it was really this podcast because it was something that uh, was well, a, a great project for the students and for the faculty that worked on it, but also really something engaging and wonderful to give back to our student community. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Elena. Beautifully said. Um, and thank you once again for having me. Um, I would give an, an introduction, but my name is Kayla. I think Dr. Hassan Docks gave me an amazing introduction, so thank you so much. Um, but it has been truly an honor to, to work on this project um, and just to really bridge that gap in knowledge because I feel like there is now becoming a more and more abundance knowledge of first generation college students. Um, but is it effective as well? Is it working? And also, 
look at that gap in knowledge from first generation college students transitioning into the professional world, where is that knowledge? So that's what we really wanted to address with our podcast here um, was to fill that gap and just to really have these mundane conversations. So um, when talking with our amazing, beautiful team, we really wanted just to think of some four objectives um, just so did it get too messy uh, and we were prepared going into this podcast as well. So first and foremost, we really wanted to gain insights into the interviewees educational and career path um, and see really how they got to where they are today um, and really just kind of just start that conversation, get comfortable with our interviewee um, so we can really have that free flowing conversation. Um, second, we wanted to highlight the specific struggles, triumphs of being a first generation students, if any. Um, and we really wanted to highlight if any as well, because some of the conversations that we had with these um, professionals, they said, you know what, I felt like I had a really great, strong, supported system at my school. I had amazing mentors. So we wanted to learn from that. We wanted to continue to do what they're doing um, and to share with our listeners and to share with our students how they can be successful as a first generation student and know they're supported. But we also had um, some interviewees where they said, you know what, I didn't feel supported at all. Um, and I felt really alone and I didn't know what to do. And I had those feelings of imposter syndrome. And even going into my workplace, I felt even those more feelings of imposter syndrome because I did have all those services, but you lose those services when you graduate and you're not as in tune to when them you're when you're an alumni. Um, so it was really good to highlight, you know, the the amazing and the bad as well, because it's, it sparks those conversations and it gets our, our listeners um, just really listening into what they can do right now as a college student to really get them better equipped for the professional world. Um, and three, we wanted to understand how the interviewee adapted to workplace culture post-graduation. Um, and some of the things that we touch base on is what is business casual? You know, we're kind of getting ready into um, this professional world and we're expected to know these terms, the hidden curriculum of it all, like Elena said. Um, we're expected to know what office hours are as these first generation college students. So really just dive into what that workplace culture is like um, and how it is to maintain that professionalism, but still be yourself in that work environment. Um, and four, and lastly, we wanted to just provide advice um, because as a podcast, of course, we wanted to be structured and we wanted to be professional, um, but we wanted also to allow our space for our interviewee to be vulnerable if possible. And if they also felt comfortable in that space too, as well, um, just to to really, you know, if you could give your, uh, your younger piece of advice, what would you tell them? Um, and that would really just help our listeners as well, because right now we're in the thick of it. And if anything, we need that advice now more than ever. So please share with us what you wish you knew. Um, and it really allowed our interviewee just to get vulnerable with us and just to have those mundane and those conversations, which really allowed us to kind of break the ice um, and be vulnerable with each other. But moving forward, um, we are going to talk about the first generation professional slide. So if we can move on to the next slide, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, so this is just an example of what that looks like. So we have our, a lovely interview with Jose Medina. Um, and some of the things that we talked about in this podcast is how there's different types of first generation college students. We wanted to make sure that we're appealing to all of our different audiences. So of course, we had that STEM aspect. We have that humanities aspect, but we also interviewed a array of different first generation college students and I wanted to also highlight Jose Medina just because he's a different type of first generation college student in a sense that his parents actually went to university but in a different country so what is that like when you're in the United States but it's still like that different hidden curriculum because they can't you know help their unfortunately their son because it's a different way of applying it's a different way of going to school and that just different header curriculum with navigating those relationships with your professors um so we wanted to continue to have those mundane conversations. Um, but if we move on to the next slide, something that I really, really am excited to talk about is our after hours segment, which is something that I came up with um, just because I really like that structured and formal conversations. Um, but as a communication major, I love to talk, but I also like to, you know, get vulnerable if we can. Um, so this allowed myself for Sofia Bonuelos, our other counterpart. And I also want to highlight um, Sarah Cortez, who is someone who else who worked on this amazing project with us. Um, she graduated in 2024 and she's doing amazing things, but we were able to have amazing conversations with my peers um, where we dissected um, academic terms like imposter syndrome, moving on to trespasser syndrome and what that looks like, um, hidden curriculum, of course, assuming that we know all these terms, um, as well as um, investigating the validation theory by Laura Rendon, which is an amazing theory that I um, encourage you all to um, 
read upon. So we also had those um, peer reviewed journals to kind of back up those conversations that we had, um, but it really allowed um, my peers just to get vulnerable. And I encouraged um, listeners to really tune into that because you can you know, read about imposter syndrome on these academic journals and you can hear about it constantly from your professors, but I feel like it's different to hear something from your peers. And it was also very important just to hear from my peers as well, which I felt like I was close to, but you know, turning on that camera and turning on that microphone, it's a different thing because we were forced to kind of get vulnerable with each other and realize that we go through those same experiences but why do no one why does no one talk about them you know we go through it every single day but we're so scared and we're embarrassed in a way to talk about it um, so this was really an amazing space where we kind of had those conversations um, but we still had that educational aspect where we had those peer-reviewed and academic journals to kind of back up those conversations um, but allowed uh, us to once again get vulnerable and allowed our um, um, listeners to kind of feel like they were a part of the conversation and we also encouraged our listeners to you know have these conversations with their peers because I know I felt a lot better um, after having those segments um, with them and I, I missed it if anything but thank you so much and that was just a little bit about the first generation professionals project thank you we're gonna um, move on and um Oh, so, sorry, Michelle, thank you. Um, maybe what we'll do is uh, we can introduce our archival materials podcast. And then uh, at the end, we would love to talk a little bit about some faculty reflections uh, working with Kayla, um, Sarah, and Sophia. Thank you, everybody, uh, for coming. Greetings to all of you from the unceded lands of the Chumash. Uh, that's where the university sits. So we titled our presentation enlivening archival materials through podcasting. And we are aware that there are many histories waiting to be told. Archives and special collections try to locate and preserve physical artifacts. We do digitize some materials, but the bulk of our archives will live in a physical format. So telling the story is telling all these stories is much easier when there are physical artifacts like letters or photographs and so on, uh, newspaper clippings come to mind, reports and government reports and documents like that. But the question became one of how to share these stories. Um, so in our archives, we because we can't collect everything, we have focused on Ventura County and the four contiguous counties, Los Angeles County, Kern County, San Luis Obispo and Santa Barbara counties. Uh, we use these to illuminate histories, the country, for example, the contributions of Chicana, Chicano population. So we have a Bracero collection. We highlight unique interconnections among various communities and collections. For example, the podcast we're going to share with you today, uh, it was actually two podcasts, shows life from a so for a point of view of an older person, uh, Jane Tomac, and a younger person, Michelle Seros, but they both lived in Oxnard, which is in Ventura County. So when we have physical artifacts, it's easier to tell these stories, it's easier to make meaning of them, but we want our students to see the potential for themselves. And so in 2021, uh, next slide, please. Right. So that sort of shows you the, the landscape that we're trying to collect histories from. Uh, we reached out to faculty in different programs. We started with communication because they had a ready-made uh, uh, medium for us, Dolphin Radio. And through Dolphin Radio, we could reach a far greater audience than just having students come to us. It was our archives going to them through the voices of students. And for us, that was incredibly valuable. Uh, next slide, please. So we have Dolphin Radio that will hold the, pro the programming, but we also have something called ScholarWorks. And this is a, a digital archive from the chancellor of the California State University. What it does is it allows us to have links there that are stable. So when this project was completed for Michelle Seros and for Jane Tomac. Uh, we have stable links at ScholarWorks. And 
this is something that students can put in their resumes. So it wasn't that we just wanted them to give us stuff and give us their labor. We wanted to give them something back. And so all these recordings are going to be available through ScholarWorks as well as through Dolphin Radio. Uh, next slide, please. So here are the completed podcasts. In 2021, I began exploring ways to expose our content uh, to a wider audience. So many years previously, our archives were the haunt of independent researchers and our campus capstone com students, mostly in history, but nobody else was coming. Nobody else was interested. So the obvious outlet for guaranteed success seemed to be to start with Dolphin Radio, because as I said earlier, the medium of the podcast would reach audiences far beyond our traditional ones. We don't even know who the audience is because nobody takes names uh, when things are being uh, listened to. So to date, we have two completed podcasts. You'll see the links here on this slide. Uh, these were done by Sara Cortez, as Kayla mentioned, mentioned her earlier. She graduated in the spring of 2024. We selected Jane Tolmach and we selected Michelle Serros because they exemplified women who transcended their traditional roles. Jane Tolmach as a local politician and Michelle Serros, who wrote about life as a skateboarding Chicana. Both men, uh, sorry, both women lived in Oxnard, which is a mid-sized city in Ventura County. Uh, Michelle was born there and Jane Tolmark was brought there when she was about two years old, but then she grew up in Oxnard. Next slide, please. And I think Evelyn, it's over to you. Hi, good afternoon. You know, uh, I'm the uh, university archivist and one of, well, or the main thing that archivists learn when they're in graduate school is to, to develop and follow the current policies and procedures of archives. That is embedded in your brain forever and ever. And so we always come at something with a set of guidelines to go by. And then as we tackle each collection and processing, we develop our own sort of way about handling uh, certain uh, aspects of the collection because every collection is different and unique and has its own special personality, right? So when we uh, set about looking uh, to uh, encourage and, and um, receive, you know, these wonderful podcasts from these students are, who are amazing, uh, one of the main things that we had to do was go back to my inherent training of establishing guidelines. So the first thing that we really wanted to do was uh, we needed collections that are obviously in relation to Ventura County, because that's primarily what we collect, even though there are dissecting uh, cities and counties, just because, you know, sometimes you'll get somebody who passed away in Ventura County, but, you know, they were born in Colorado, such as Jane Tomac. The second thing is, is that you have to make sure that you have significant material, not only to elicit the interest in the material, but also you want to make sure that you have enough research material so that the student can actually conduct research. We're, the whole point is to look at the collection and get the meat of the information from that collection as opposed to going outside and, and look at you know, other venues of information. And it's all done uh, regarding a timeline, too. So you really want to make sure that when you provide a collection, that it is not overwhelming, um, that, you know, as Goldilocks and the, the Three Bears would say, you know, it's just right. It gives you enough research information that you feel like you know the topic or the subject or the person, but yet it's not like so overwhelming that, you know, we see you run out the door and never hear from you again. So that's kind of, you know, the first thing that, that you know, you really want to look at. Um, and you've got to make the archives meaningful, right? And that has to do with generating interest. And, you know, some collections, okay, they're a little boring. Yes, I admit it. Now, they're important, especially if you're interested in history. But you've got to have a little pizzazz. You know, you've got to have a little sauciness in there. And that's why we felt that Michelle Serros and Jane Tomac were particularly interesting because they were particularly interesting women 
where they, uh, you know, as, as Monica said, they, they stepped out of the box. And so that, you know, automatically you find yourself attached to them, right. As a, as a researcher and a, and a reader. Um, the next thing is, you know, as Monica was, was talking about was, you know, we want to, um, reach out to, to someone or something that will help us, uh, broadcast, no pun intended, the information, you know, that we have. And so that's why Dolphin Radio really came into effect because they really, um, understood what we were trying to do and have, uh, really latched onto it and just, um, you know, we couldn't be happier with the results. Like, you know, thank you, Dolphin Radio. Could we have the next slide, please? So the first thing that, that you really want to do when you're acclimating the students to the collections, and I love that word acclimating because it's really kind of true because they're coming in with no idea about what you're giving them. Um, you know, we've tried to provide them with information that they could, uh, you know, research before they came here, such as, you know, the finding guides. Um, we have uh, lots of photographs online. There are supplemental uh, information available, supplemental materials available. But we really want them to see what we see where there are important interests that are there that can be communicated and people will want to know about them. So, you know, that's like kind of the first thing that that we we do is we we bring this student, you know, we in and we have lots of, of meetings with them um, and kind of let them know, OK, there's this information out there. And you can also go to, you know, like like we state, you know, other entry points in the collection rather than just, you know, the documentation. And that also brings into all the accomplishments that your subjects have uh, achieved. So, it you know, it, it again, we continue that interest, or at least we try to. We do encourage the use of the, the library's databases for the newspapers because really that's where you're going to get some information that we cannot possibly have in our collection. And you're going to get it from different viewpoints. So you're not only going to have, say, for instance, with Michelle Saros, you know, the facts about, you know, when she was born and how many books she wrote and that sort of thing, but you're also going to have... Um, opinions and you're going to have soulful letters from uh, fans about her passing and again that brings in the whole personality of who this person was that they're researching and that they're going to do the, the podcast for. One of the other things that we want to do is we want to encourage or connect the students with the living uh, living contemporaries. So for instance, with uh, Michelle Saros, Michelle's collection actually came to us via Jenny Luna. Uh, and what had happened was Michelle's husband passed along the information or the documentation, which filled up Jenny's garage, passed it along to Jenny. And then Jenny said, hey, you know what, we would like to retain some of this for Chicano studies, but also we think it's really important that the library and archives uh, retains this because when people are looking for information, where do they go? Usually the library and the archives. So um, the interview was with Jenny, um, again, a, a professor here of uh, Jenny Luna from uh, Chicano Studies, because she knew Michelle. She was friends with Michelle. She was able to talk about the Michelle that uh, maybe other people didn't see as just a writer, but also the, 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 the artist, um, who she was, the creative personality, who she was. And those interviews, I think, really add on to the whole point of archives is that we want to get the information out to the researcher and we want to bring the researcher back in for more and more and let them say, hey, you know what, I'd like to see the transcript that Michelle was working on before she passed away, you know, so we're like, hey, come on in. So it's all about, um, it is about communication, really, and that's why we love Again, Dolphin Radio. Um, again, we do meet occasionally. Uh, a lot of uh, discussion goes into place when, um, and Kayla can attest this, 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 and also Sarah, we love talking to the students because they see things on a, uh, with a different lens, uh, a different perspective 
than maybe the arch archivist does. Because sometimes I can be so deep in the archives that I don't, I'm not able to step back and see other things. So we uh, basically bounce off ideas and thoughts and processes together and uh, open our eyes to, you know, all sorts of uh, different uh, information that, you know, we wouldn't have maybe thought about. And it's kind of fun just to talk about the collection and have that, that interest, you know, it, it's really, it's really cool. Um, next slide, please. So again, we're going back to the be uh, best practices, which is really pretty simple, actually, but you just want to make sure that that you follow these best practices and then add your own as you go uh, in the different situations. So of course, again, you want to engage the students in the depth of the material. Um, it's going to be lots of different subjects and topics. And so there's a lot of variety there that somebody can find an interest in. You want to communicate the significance of the collections and how that they can continually be used to educate students and the, and the, the community as well. Um, this all has to do with going back and, and uh, letting the student know, you know what, we have a finding guide, so take a look at that. And so you get an idea about what's in the collection and then, you know, take a look at some outside sources. So you get a really nice, broad idea of who this personality was. And then, um, yes, we encourage them to identify with uh, the connections embedded already in the materials. And many of our, con our, our materials actually relate to each other in a funny kind of way. So I can take in a, what we call a political collection, and it actually has a lot of references to uh, one of our environmental collections and so on and so on. So it's really kind of cool. It's kind of like that, what is it, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon? You never know what you're going to find until you actually get into the collection. It's like, oh, wow. And so, you know, you have all these, you know, Venn diagrams going on, which again, really helps the student, it relaxes the student because they know that they can go for, uh, to other collections for information if they need to, because there's nothing worse than realizing you're in a timeline and what the heck, I don't have enough information to do what I need to do. Um, definitely, you've got to advertise what you're doing. And as Monica stated, you know, we have all these wonderful sources, these resources, we're so blessed. Dolphin Radio, the Scholar Works, we have the, uh, we put out our, um, we basically advertise ourselves in our library's annual report. You know, we have our our um, archives web pages, and then, you know, of course, and there's other access points. Again, what we're working on now is the podcast. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the takeaways, and they're all extremely positive. And this is why I love coming to work every day. So we receive positive feedback from the audiences, whether um, you know we're doing a podcast or whether we're um, teaching an archive class or just you know in an email when somebody says, "Hey, can you give me you know this information?" And I'm like, "Yes, I can." Um, it's it, that you know that's what makes my day. Then you have the students who learn to create timelines and objectives for themselves, which is a great takeaway for uh, moving on into, you know, the big cruel world. You know, it's like sometimes, you know, you really have got to have those timelines in order to get through through the, the job that you take. And one of the best things I think is that the students form their own perspectives and they create their original work. Like we guide them there and we can say, well, we really like this, but, and we like this, but, you know, what do you think? And then they create this wonderful original work and, and that's really, I think, the best takeaway of all. But then, of course, they can add it to the resume. So that's also a really good thing. And again, through like Dolphin Radio, for instance, it creates, we hope, additional interest in the archival collections that people will say, oh, hey, are you interested? Do you have this? You know, we're interested in this, this type of thing, like Camarillo State Hospital. We used to be Camarillo State Hospital, which, you know, was a very big thing if you lived in Ventura County or Los Angeles County. So then they'll contact us and say, hey, I'm kind of interested in this. And you could say, oh, well, we have this website. So, I mean, all of this is really uh, a, a very positive aspect. And I think that, and it benefits every single person who becomes involved in it. So and if you have any questions or comments, you can always um, 
email me directly at evelyn.taylor at csuci.edu. I'm always happy to uh, answer any questions about um, any of the the collections that we have, or just in general, this the 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 podcast that we've uh, generated with Dolphin Radio. So very nice to see you all today, and thank you for coming. Thank you so much, Evelyn. Um, and actually going to briefly talk about, so if we can go back to the next slide, the, the slide before, that'd be greatly appreciated. Um, the future podcast that I'm actually working with, I've been working with the amazing Evelyn and Monica um, and just being able to pick their brains has been just truly an amazing experience um, because I think it's an amazing um, thing just to get different expect uh, perspectives um, just because I'm taking in so much information. But when I first began this project, um, I knew that the archives from, I knew the archives held pieces of CSUCI's past, um, but I just didn't realize how transformative it would be to see everything just come together and just to touch the records, to read the documents, to feel the weight of the stories being preserved in those files. I feel like it was opening a door into a different era, once that was filled with so many lives, so many moments, and so many memories that helped shape not only this campus, but also the surrounding community. And as a student, I couldn't help but think, why don't we talk about this history more? Throughout this experience, I was able to work alongside, once again, the amazing Evelyn and uh, Monica, whose knowledge was truly invaluable. Talking to them and hearing their insights added an entirely new layer of understanding, and I could just see how they truly care about preserving these histories, and also just their enthusiasm made me even more passionate about this project. They shared so many stories about Camarillo State Hospital, which once stood here, and the evolution of this campus. They helped me understand how the hospital wasn't just a place of dark history, but it was also a community with its own routine, struggles, and aspirations. People lived here, they worked here, and they had experiences that were both challenging and inspiring. But this wasn't just conversations with Monica and Evelyn that made me experience this special it was also the archives themselves that were just mesmerizing. Each box and folder I opened revealed something new, unique, whether it was photographs that I found that were captured and moments frozen in time, letters that revealed personal thoughts, um, or even documents that just trace the development of mental health care. There was so much depth here and each piece felt like a small window into a larger story that deserved to be told. It was almost like the campus was speaking through these documents and I felt a responsibility to listen carefully and share these stories with others. I feel now like walking through this campus, it's easy to forget this history. We see classrooms, study areas and recreational sp spaces, but each of those buildings holds its own story. These library archives brought this reality to life, helping me see the connection between the past and the present in a way that I think every CI student should have the opportunity to experience. I feel a deep sense of responsibility to inform these students about this history, especially because many of us don't know the full story of the land that we're on. We're a part of this new chapter here, but that doesn't mean we should forget the old chapters that came before us. It's important to acknowledge its history, and it's important to recognize the beauty and the challenges it represents. The hospital isn't just a relic, it's a foundation, and by understanding it, we can better appreciate the journey to let us where we are today. Uh, but one of the things that I love most about the archives was the chance to, to see the dynamic and how multifaceted the history was. The hospital had so many departments and programs, initiatives that were at the forefront of psychiatric and developmental disability care. For instance, there was extensive art and music programs, which gave patients an outlet for creativity and self-expression. And these initiatives showed me that this hospital wasn't solely defined by its challenges, but it was a place where people worked hard to create these meaningful supporting environments, despite the limitations of time. And this perspective honestly changed my initial view of Camarillo State Hospital because I know we all have our opinions and our biases just hearing about Camarillo State Hospital in itself. But really with this, what does it mean for CSUCI students? I believe we have an obligation to carry this legacy with respect and awareness because this history shouldn't be something that's lived in this archives, tucked away in these boxes. It should be something that we're actively engaging and talking about. The legacy of a campus is part of our education and our shared identity, and I think it's our responsibility to continue to educate it. 
So really with this podcast, I really want to encourage reflection because when I was going through these boxes, I had to take a lot of time myself to just reflect about what I was reading because it was a lot. So with this, I just strictly want to bring um, to our listeners what I read, what I saw, everything, and really just encourage them to reflect and come up with their own opinions and just do their own research as well. Um, but once again, Monica and Evelyn taught me something profound about the role of being an archivist, not only to preserve the documents, but to also just keep these stories alive. And through this experience, I've realized that I can be a part of this mission. And by sharing these stories through podcasting, through these different ways of storytelling, um, can be something that's truly remarkable because it's ensuring that these stories that were here before us are not forgotten. So I really want to say that this experience with this archives has left me with a lasting appreciation for this history of our campus, and I just want to share it. Um, so I hope that CSUCI is just not a place for academic growth, but it's a place that holds memories, struggles, and triumphs, but from a different time. Um, so thank you so much. I just wanted to speak a little briefly about our upcoming podcast series, just because I'm very, very excited just to start filming with it all. Um, but to move forward to our next slide, just to briefly talk about my overall just student reflection and just how much this process has just meant to me. I've had amazing opportunities because of the Dolphin Radio and because of the channel, Your Potential Grant, um, that I wouldn't have without, honestly, this amazing panel here and with about these amazing faculty members. Um, I was able to attend CSUN's, like Elena said, um, their conference where I was able to meet not only other faculty members, but also students like myself who were um, engaging in their own projects with their uh, and seeing what they were doing with their grant money. Um, so it was really good to, really interesting just to pick their brains and see what their own initiatives about as well as share my initiatives. Um, but it was also really amazing to hear from amazing panelists as well as just learn from the Apple team. Um, because if you tune to any of our episodes, um, I've made all of those <laughs> intros and outros on GarageBand and I wasn't able to do that without learning from those amazing Apple professionals um, and learning how the importance of marketing as well through um, podcasts because you can spend all your time and energy into these podcasts but if you're not marketing about it no one's going to tune in um, so also the importance of that in itself um, but if you look at the next picture as well um, I was able to attend and I have an amazing team right here Sophia and Sarah um, where we were able to um, create a paper and also perform on a panel and talk about our first generation professionals podcast and experience I mean we were also, also awarded top paper at the Western Communication Associations Conference which is amazing experience um, which we were just able to speak on and it's just been very very validating learning from amazing professionals the one that are alongside me today and also the amazing professionals and mentors that I've created along this journey, um, because that in itself is just a whole nother experience outside of the world of podcasting, because I feel like I'm a very much so a visual learner. So seeing how these professionals carry themselves and how they compose themselves with just such grace um, and seeing just these amazing strong women beside me today um, is encouraging me to be the professional that I am in the future. And it is once again, has just been truly awarding experience. Um, and I'm very, very thankful for everything. So with that being said, I want to move it um, forward to our amazing communication department where they can talk more about their experiences and our little bit about our student faculty collaboration. But thank you again. It has been truly a pleasure. Thanks, Kayla. Um, and Kayla is amazing, everyone. So one of the best practices might perhaps be finding an excellent student like Kayla and exploiting them as much as possible. Um, I want to thank you all for being here today, and I'd also like to thank my colleagues on the panel um, for providing the opportunities discussed to both myself and to my students. In a minute, we'll hear from my colleague Nancy. I think I speak on behalf of her when I say that this type of work is really indicative of Channel Islands, where we value interdisciplinary scholarship, we value reaching across the academic silos to work together to produce public scholarship. And I think the projects we're hearing about today is really a, a great uh, example of how we can do that well. I wanted to talk just for a few minutes about my own reflections in terms of being a faculty mentor on these uh, projects. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities and, and best practices, but also some of the challenges that we might all face moving forward when we're pursuing these types of things. So first of all, I want to talk about my best practices. I think one of the things I try to do as a faculty member is recognize that podcasting is indeed scholarship. 
and to approach it as such. It's creative activity and our students need to be uh, well informed about how they create interview questions, how they go out into the community and engage with stakeholders as they prepare the podcast. They also need to be educated on story structure and of course there's the technical um, elements that go along with it as Kayla mentioned. So I think I always bring that lens to it when I'm trying to work with my students because uh, podcasts for entertainment purposes are absolutely essential. They have their place and we do those at Dolphin Radio too. But these sorts of collaborative projects really lend themselves more to a research slash scholarship lens. And so when I'm trying to work with students, I try to take that approach. So as with all research, I really try to prep students for the ambiguity that goes along with any type of more qualitative based research. As we know, you don't really know what you're gonna find until you start doing it. And I think sometimes for students, especially those that are used to a relatively rigid approach curricularly in their college career, um, or even in their uh, K through 12 education, ambiguity can be a little bit scary uh, and so trying to work with them to help them understand that, yes, in fact, you are going to find something. It may be what you expected. It may not be. Um, but uh, being comfortable with and living with that ambiguity. Uh, at the same time, I'm trying to encourage students to take some of those risks uh, and be prepared to fail. Um, and I think this is another skill that sometimes is challenging uh, for students. And Kayla, you might be able to, um, to, to back me up on that. Um, but it's okay to fail in some of these things. As we all know, when we've done our own research, sometimes the results come back like you want, and sometimes they come back uh, as you don't want. Um, and both cases provide you with useful data. Uh, finally, I try to be open to the student ideas, um, and I think that we've seen a couple examples in our presentation today of where Kayla really came up with something great. The after hours segment is probably uh, the best example of that, and we as faculty really have to be comfortable with just letting uh, our students run with those ideas, giving them the autonomy, the confidence, the motivation to experiment, and seeing what happens. Um, I also just want to uh, conclude with a few kind of challenges that I've faced uh, as a faculty mentor, and then I'd love to turn it over to Nancy to speak about her experiences. Um, finding the right balance between providing our students with guidance and fostering that sense of autonomy, I'm not sure I've reached that point yet. I know it is sometimes a, a student by student basis, but I always kind of wonder, am I uh, micromanaging the student? Am I giving them not enough guidance to where they're feeling lost? So that's a challenge that if any of you have any feedback or ideas for navigating in an effective manner, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, another kind of challenge for faculty is where do podcasts and the type of student mentoring that we're talking about today fit in our retention, tenure, and promotion file. So I have personally challenged, faced challenges with this because uh, the, the guidelines at Channel Islands recognize so-called traditional scholarship and don't necessarily recognize podcasts as anything beyond a broad category of creative activity. And so I wish there were better ways for us as scholars to acknowledge and credit the work that goes into podcasting so that it, quote unquote, counts for faculty that are up for tenure or promotion. Um, and then finally, it's a challenge probably at your institutions as well. Certainly it is in the California State University system, the fiscal resources. Dolphin Radio is quite cheap. And yet every year I have to go out and beg for the funds to, to keep the radio going. I'm grateful for the grant funding that we received from uh, Michelle's team to allow us to travel to the conference and provide money for equipment from Apple. Um, but that is uh, still a temporary solution. So, you know, that's one of the challenges is never really being able to plan much more than a couple of years in advance because of the tenuous budgetary situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and so those are a few of the challenges that I keep in the back of my mind as I'm working with students on projects like these. Um, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Nancy. She is also in communication studies with me and has mentored some students on these projects. And I'm sure she has some um, of her own best practices to add. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you, Christina. Um, so good morning, everyone. I am Nancy Chen, and I am a faculty member in the Communication Studies Department um, at Cal State Channel Islands. Um, so to be honest, um, my colleagues, Christina, Monica, Avalyn, they really make my role as a faculty mentor easy. <laughs> Um, for transparency, Christina um, is the faculty advisor to Dolphin Radio, which is our student-run uh, campus radio station um, at CSU Channel Islands. But last semester, Christina was on sabbatical, so I had the pleasure of working with the student producers and managers for Dolphin Radio. So Sarah Cortez, which you can see on the screen, um, the two photos in the middle, she's on the left, um, was one of those students. Um, she was a graduating senior. And by the point when I started working with Sarah, she was already quite competent technically. She um, did a radio production class with Christina and she also um, produced some of the material for the first generation podcast series. So she already knew um, the process of producing podcast. And um, so for me, um, I felt like my support was really um, limited to just um, giving her feedback. Um, I didn't have to teach her anything from scratch. It's just about giving her feedback um, on the interview questions that she developed for the interviewees, um, the script that she put together, on the rough cuts that she produced. Um, kind of, it's more like a, a conversation um, rather than um, having to um, actually um, teach her any skills. Um, and then also, you know, my colleagues from the library, Evelyn and Monica. Uh, Monica was the person who actually approached us with the idea for collaboration. Um, I think the library really wanted to highlight the wonderful archival collections we have. Um, and through Dolphin Radio, we felt like this would be a good opportunity to not just showcase the collections, but also illustrate to the students the different types of engagement that they can have with the collection and the type of creative work that can result from such um, such engagement. So um, once Monica uh, brought the idea to us and we decided to collaborate, um, then um, I introduced um, Sarah to Monica and to Evelyn and Evelyn was so knowledgeable about the different collections that we have at CI. So I accompanied Sarah to her first visit to the archive. And what I really appreciated from Monica and from Evelyn was that they gave Sarah really good suggestions on the type of uh, materials that they have and what might be of the greatest interest to our campus audience, um, mostly faculty and students, because they have so much um, in the archive and then they couldn't highlight everything. So they had to be selective. But then they also encouraged Sarah to discover the hidden gems and make her own discoveries to find some untold stories um, that remain to be shared from the archive. So like Christina was mentioning, it's a good balance between giving guidance, but also allowing the students um, to, you know, be creative themselves. Um, so yeah, so for me, the process was really enjoyable because I really ha had um, wonderful colleagues who were really knowledgeable about the subject matter. And um, I had a great student who was already well trained <laughs> through the different coursework that she completed. Um, so it was more for me just an opportunity to appreciate um, the creativity of our students, um, you know, the commitment of my colleagues, and also, you know, the amount of hidden gems that remain to be discovered um, from our library archives. Um, so with that, just a little bit of my reflection. Thank you. So thank you. I, I do want to say thank you to my colleagues at CSU Channel Islands for joining on this panel um, and for folks in the audience, thank you for your attention. As we conclude this session on best practices for student faculty collaboration, um, we hope that these case studies have demonstrated the transformative potential of working together to produce meaningful community-centered projects. And through collaborative efforts um, like those we learned about today, we can see how empowering students as storytellers and researchers can deepen their academic and personal growth, foster a sense of belonging, and ultimately prepare them for life beyond the university. So just thank you again for joining us today and for your commitment to elevating student voices through collaborative innovation. Um, we look forward to continuing this conversation, building more spaces where students and faculty can work together to shape knowledge and tell stories that matter. And so with that, we'd like to open it up to any audience questions for any of our panelists today.
You know, the Robin. Hi, folks. Thanks so much for the uh, conversation today. Um, I had one question, um, particularly when you're sending students out into the community and maybe, you know, beyond your archives, beyond beyond your school. Do you have any suggestions on helping them make those cold calls to engage the other people that they're that they're trying to bring on as guests, the other perspectives that they're trying to acquire? Maybe I could start if that's okay with everyone. And Robin, I'm only uh, starting because I am dealing with this right now. In our uh, Dolphin Radio class, uh, we do ask students to go out and profile different um, organizations, primarily on campus for now, just because of pragmatic reasons. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I think they are completely terrified of the idea of just reaching out to folks. Um, and so I would say twofold. Uh, I provide them with a list of potential uh, people to reach out to. Uh, and the reason is because these are folks that I know uh, their position. I know that they're relatively student friendly and they want to advocate for their particular program or organization. And I also provide the students with a script of how to reach out. Um, and the reason I do that is because I do uh, find that not all of them have that same level of professionalism. Uh, that Kayla has. I think one thing among so many that make Kayla truly amazing is that she has already built in that level of professionalism that I think um, may sometimes be a challenge for some of our students. So I do provide them with, I actually give them more than one potential script where it says, you know, dear so-and-so, you know, insert name here, right? And I provide the script for them to um, uh, to reach out. And I do find that when they copy me on those emails, um, they, they are using those scripts. Um, but I also do state in class that I know this is scary, but this is something you have to do. And it's part of life as well. Uh, I'll just say one other thing, and then I'll pass it over to Nancy and Keisha, or, or even Monica and Evelyn, if you, if you have any suggestions. But we are fortunate on our campus that we have something called the Center for Community Engagement. And it's funded by our chancellor's office as well as our campus. And it's meant to be a, a, a central com uh, organizational com place where um, they facilitate relationships with uh, off-campus nonprofit organizations. So when students are interested in going out into the community, we already have that hub on our campus to facilitate that process. And so if, you, if your organization doesn't have something like that, it might be worth worth looking into. Service learning is one of the kind of pillars of a Channel Islands education. And so all of our students are expected at various levels of their curriculum to go out and engage with the community. Sometimes that can look like a single event on a weekend for lower division classes. Um, for the communication capstone course, all of our students are required to go out and do, is it 80 hours, I believe now, Nancy? of work with a local uh, nonprofit and using their communication skills out in the community. Um, and so maybe having so, sort of a more formal mechanism might be something to pursue as well. Um, I'll stop talking now and, and see if Nancy or others have any thoughts. Thanks for that question, Robin. Um, maybe one thing to add, when I was working with Sarah, um, I think the advantage of um, having um, an on-campus radio station that you are producing for is um, you can make clear um, about the purpose of the podcast and then um, you know you can um, kind of um, really be clear about the impact that this particular interview or podcast will have um, on the audience on the local community um, so I'm, I, I made sure Sarah kind of introduced um, Dolphin Radio earlier on in her email so that um, this is just not this is not just a random interview request, but it's being produced for a campus for a station and it will really inform the community. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's the hope that this will really encourage um, kind of um, greater acceptance of our request. Um, so something else to add. And I'd like to, to add. I'm sorry, Kayla, you go first. No, go ahead, Monica, and I'll go last. Go ahead, please. I was going to say when when Sarah was doing her interviews, she had to call somebody at in city government, and they heard she was a student, and they gave her the runaround. And so, in part of the the process where we engage with the students and ask, "How's it going? Can I help with anything?" This story came out. So I said, "What number did you call?" And I called the same number, and uh, 
I received the same thing. And so I said in front of Sarah, who was standing right there, is there someone else I can speak with who would be more knowledgeable about this? If not, who do you suggest? I call if it's not even in your office, who? But I have to have a name. And simply having that pushback, because it's not a student calling now, it's an older student calling now, and I will have an answer. But to have her listen in on that, I think was important for her own sense of ballast. And we did get somebody. Um, just to add on to what everyone's saying, because I think ditto to everything, um, but just to really break everything down for students, I feel like is the biggest thing. Um, and that's what really helps me. Um, I'm lucky enough. I'm a student supervisor also on campus. I work for housing um, and I do a lot of LinkedIn workshops on how to reach out to people um, and also just how to send in professional emails. And I feel like it's less intimidating when it's coming from a student um, just because I'm in the same shoes as them. So sometimes it's nice to hear it from that student perspective as well. Maybe even alumni, some recently graduated people. Um, um, but really, I just like to break everything down from them to the email signature to like the how, how are you doing? Um, just because that's the hidden curriculum of it all is assuming that these students know every single step. Um, so it's like, oh, you of course you have, you know that you're supposed to address the person and say, I hope this email finds you well. But that is the hidden curriculum and they truly don't know sometimes. So I think really breaking it down and I feel like um, Dr. Smith does a great example of giving different options as well, because you also want to show your personality through that email as well, especially when you're reaching out to those interviewees. If you're sounding like a robot or a, like a chat GPT email, uh, I, can, I can tell if it's a chat GPT email or not, if it's personable or like, how am I getting to you? So really breaking that down, like, how are you? And also breaking down what the project is what is like a what it is about so they know what they're getting themselves into and they're not wasting their time where they have to send a hundred emails back and forth and that whole email kind of breaks everything down for them um so really just bringing everything down from them to addressing them personally saying hello doctor so and so because studies show that saying hello versus hello and saying their name it makes it a lot more personable and it's not just a general email so just showing those things and really breaking it down for them and almost holding their hand in a way um really helps go a long way and seeing like what information should go where because it really is like you're it's a paragraph but it's like how do I structure this story in an email if that makes sense and I also think helping um, those students create those professional email signatures go a long way because I know I've talked to a lot of professionals who I can tell are not taking me seriously because I am a student um, so also practicing that confidence as well and knowing how to stand your ground I think having mock um, conversations or even having those mock emails as well. It might seem silly, but also just the repetitiveness as well. Um, continuing to put those students out of their comfort zones go a long way. It might be silly at first, especially if they have their peers that they know, but going it over and over again and also standing your ground is another thing because I know we've all run into issues where we're talking to someone and they're not giving us the answers we want to because they're not taking us seriously. Um, so still holding that confidence. And like Monica said, if you're not giving me the answer, I'm going to find someone who will give me the answer um so just kind of giving them that confidence and that repetition helps them a lot and just honestly at the end of the day breaking everything down for them and providing examples um and knowing that students learn differently um so maybe some might be visual learners some might have to really be in the thick of it to know um so yeah and i'm going to talk too much i'm a communication major so if anyone has any questions please let us know <laughs> I'll um, take over for Michelle because I think she's having some internet challenges with the fire. We have had some power and internet outages. So um, just to make sure that uh, that um, we are able to keep going, I'm going to take that role on for Michelle just for the last couple of minutes. Um, I did want to just acknowledge two things in the chat quickly. Uh, Rebecca, thank you for that excellent uh, suggestion regarding the autonomy gu guidance balance. Um, those are some great, that's some great feedback. There's also a question I just wanted to read uh, from Sebastian. Is the Dolphin Radio course the only mechanism to generate constant influx of future students to sustain this broader work? Um, the short answer, Sebastian, is yes. For now, it is. Um, Dolphin Radio is uh, relatively resource um, scarce. 
I guess. And so the communication program does use a couple of different mechanisms to get students to participate. So the first that I mentioned earlier and that Nancy supervised uh, Sarah's project is our capstone course. And so uh, Dolphin Radio is a recognized community partner at our Center for Community Engagement. And so as such, students are eligible to serve their capstone course for Dolphin Radio. However, in order to do that, they do need to have taken the Dolphin Radio course. It, it's currently structured to be sort of a combination of theory and practice insofar as we cover the history of broadcasting and things like that, in addition to the more technical side of creating a podcast. So once they've completed that class, which does involve a final semester project of a, a podcast where they do, as I mentioned, go out and interview a campus entity and create something about that that students will find useful um, that highlights a service or an organization on campus, then they really have the basics to come and serve as the managers for the, the capstone class. In that capstone class, they're really doing more of the sort of station management. We're an internet radio station, so it is going to be different from your sort of terrestrial terrestrial stations. Um, and so the, the look looks a little bit uh, different. Um, but yes, that's kind of how we get students. I will say that I'm constantly out there kind of um, advocating and trying to drum up interest for students across campus. We've had a couple of takers, but it, it's a challenge, right? So I think students have one sort of um, idea of what participation might look like. And so the idea is that um, they will come and sit in a chair and talk for an hour and then leave. And so when they come and meet with me and I say, well, I'm going to need a formal proposal about a show that you'd like to do. I need X, Y, and Z. That interest kind of tends to wane. Um, and so uh, it, it has been, you know, difficult to expand beyond communication. And if anyone has some suggestions or ideas um, it, uh, for that, I welcome them. But it's really our manager's job to go out and promote. Kayla does a terrific job of that. So thanks for that question, Sebastian. Um, I'm not sure if Michelle's back on with us, but I guess I'll just in, uh, ask if there are any other questions or comments. Sure, I was curious about something. So it sounds to me like, um, you know, Camarillo State Hospital, this is a, a scholarly archival project largely based in documentation and photographs, all very visual things. Why did you ultimately decide to make a podcast about it, given that they're so visual in nature? And what do you think it is about podcasts that help connect with students and connect with the community in new ways? Kayla, you want to go for that one? Yeah, I can I can start us off. Um, we I have honestly just been in love with the idea of podcasting and how it's just a different form of storytelling, um, just because, as you know, there's just so many different ways to tell a story. Um, but what I've been finding is just with um, talking to students um, and meeting with them um, very oftenly is they're on the go, especially since a lot of students um, have a lot of jobs right now, so, including myself. Um, we actually are collaborating with the CI View to produce those CI news stories um, and kind of have them as audiobooks on our Dolphin radio station. Um, so it's called like our CI Views Thursday Thoughts. So what I was hearing from students is I don't have time to read. I have a bunch of these, you know, um, discussion posts that I have to do from my professors and I have to read all of those peer reviewed and then I have to reply and then I have to do this. Um, so something that I was finding for my peers a lot is I need something that I can click and listen to on my way walking to class or when I'm driving on my way to work um, or when, on my way on my drive home to my commute home when I'm visiting home for the family. Um, what I'm finding is podcasting is just becoming um, a very popular form of storytelling amongst my peers and just honestly amongst the US, especially after post pandemic era. Um, like we said in the welcome session, um, people have been podcasting for 10 plus years, um, but now we're even seeing even a more rise of podcasters just because of post pandemic. Um, so that's something that we wanted to do was just have everything like kind of on the go just to make it more accessible to users, because that's really what I always try to prioritize is accessibility through it all um, and making sure 
these students are actually tuning in um, because I can write a bunch of these peer-reviewed, I can write a peer-reviewed journal, I can post something on our website, but are students really going to tune into it? Um, so those are the actually the conversations that I've been having with Monica and Evelyn is there's a lot of visual aspects of it, like you mentioned, Rebecca, and that's a very great point. So we were thinking of, we of course have our Instagram account where we can post content like that. Um, but I was actually talking to Monica and Evelyn about the, um, creating a hub, like a, a website, a Google site of some, core, um, some sort um, to put those images up so we can guide those viewers who are tuning into our podcast um, to have that as well. Um, and I've also been exploring the idea of having that visual podcast because as you know, you can tune in um, most of the time for podcasts. They have that visual aspect where they post on YouTube or even on Spotify, you have that option to actually see it. Um, we actually had a CI um, debate recently and they had the option to either tune in auditorily um, or they actually had the option to see those students as well have that debate in that moment. Um, so we are looking at different hub spots to, you know, make sure they have that option to, you know, look at those um, archives that they want to have that chance and also to look at those pictures. So you bring up a great point. Um, but the reason why we decided to go with the idea of podcasting is really just to make it accessible to our students since they're constantly on on the go. And I'd like to add to that, that the, the visual stuff is so readily available. Students take classes in what used to be patient rooms. These have all been refurbished for HVAC and all this kind of thing. But when you look at the outside and you walk inside, you still see the pillars. You still see the shape of the room. Students are already living in the hospital setting. They just don't realize it. They could just imagine a little bit that 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there were patients rolled up in beds right here. There was a nurse's station right over there. You can see the shell of it but it's all been transformed for 21st century usage, but it's the same building. The library is half old building and half new building. Maybe we used to have a morgue downstairs in the basement. It's gone now, obviously, but students like that right around Halloween. They all wanna come over and see the morgue. And it's a huge disappointment to them that we've told them that the little refrigerated units, they're all gone now, sorry. Build your own, you know? But yes, it is, it, it, this is extremely relatable to the students. They walk on campus, they are seeing the hospital buildings, but they don't realize it. And so the podcast is sort of going to build on that. Well, I'm going to take a leap here. Um, since I've been here, well, since it opened practically, what, almost 25 years, um, when, when when I first started as the archivist here, they had just closed the hospital a couple of years, ish, three, four years before. And it was not something that you talked about. It was not something, a history that you explored. And in fact, I remember <laughs> when I first started, I was like, oh, I got all these cool artifacts. And I wanted to do an exhibit of like, you know, a pacemaker and a couple of saws and all kinds of, you know, stuff. And they were basically like, no, 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 no. You may not. You may not. Right. And so I was like, OK, fine. So, I mean, the whole point of of opening up the records. So our 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 um, former staff and uh, there wasn't a faculty, former staff from Camarillo State Hospital, basically gathered the information, literally gathered the information from various rooms as the hospital was shutting down. And they put them in a little uh, broom closet in the old hospital building, which is where we are now. And so, you know, it, it's a mishmash of stuff because it, it is literally what, what was left behind. So it's mostly, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, but you can get earlier stuff through the newspapers. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, this was like secret, you know, information that nobody was, you know, to know about or talk about for sure for many, many years. And then people like faculty 
sort of started putting their little toe in the water, right? And so, oh, I'm having this freshman English class and can I bring my students over to go through the Cameron Real Estate Hospital collection so they can um, get creative and, you know, write a, they've written a script, they do a map, they take the students all around the campus and talk about the buildings, um, all sorts of different things. And so we started with that 2004, right? And then other people got brave. And then they started thinking about other projects and topics and subjects, how they could sort of put, you know, Cameron Real Estate Hospital in there, you know. And now we have openly faculty members who who contact me and say, hey, you know, I'm I'm talking about this or I'm doing this in my class. Can you come and talk about the hospital and also archives and how important it is, right? And like, that is just really cool because, you know, as librarians, we never do conform, right? Like we're the, I mean, you know, we just have, you know, uh, a faculty as well, you know, we have that independent spirit and it's all about getting the information out there uh, and uh, we don't hide anything. So um, it's been a, a great and a positive journey throughout my time here to see this happen. And, you know, we, we have a wonderful website through the CSU that has every photo that we have, uh, a lot of documentation, and we still have students who come in and, you know, they're interested in, uh, you know, especially English students or, um, you know, well, how can I write about this? You know, how, how can I um, talk about this? And, and you know, uh, as uh, Kayla has found, it's very interesting information that you don't realize that exists and, oh, gee, maybe we can look at things that is a different perspective. So, that's why we chose Camarillo State Hospital because, you know, we're on a roll and I say, you know, let's go for it. So, you know, thank you, Dolphin Radio, for like, you know, opening up the vault and bringing out the secrets. Yes, thank you all. And stay tuned for that great podcast. We'll share the links um, with folks, anyone who is interested. And thank you all so much for your attention this morning, um, for putting some ideas, takeaways in the chat. Um, it was wonderful to, to share some of our work with you all. Hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you.